partner uh, with this ministry, and we have partnered with this ministry, and, and to do so as we go forward. And Lord, we want to go back. And uh, Lord, as we see these pictures and uh, see these lives that have been touched and the lives that still need to be touched uh, and see the work that you are doing down there, Lord, just continue to bless the ministry of Jeremy and Delia and their family and, and David and Aida and, and their family as well. And for Calvary Chapel, Roatan, Lord, that your word would go forth that your spirit would move and that you would continue to, to just be a shining light, a beacon to those that are down there on this island living, living in desperation because they don't know you yet. And Lord, we just ask for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Delia. Great job with that video. Kids can go out now if you want. While they're exiting, if you would, uh, open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll start off at verse 1. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So those first three verses there start with that word, therefore, and we go back because it says therefore, and, and look at what it's there for. Go back to our chapter from last week. We'll just look at the last, just a couple verses. Verse 12 uh, through 14, actually, in Hebrews 5. The author was making this point we talked about last week. He says, for by this time you ought to be teachers. Remember we talked about that last week. By this time you ought to be teachers. You need to, someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the world, word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And now he goes on and says, therefore, let us leave those elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. We're not going to lay again that foundation. We shouldn't be eating pureed green beans anymore. We should be supplementing our understanding of the elementary doctrines of Christ, supplementing that, the basics that have been laid, that foundation that has been laid, the repentance from dead works, the faith toward God, instruction about washings, and the laying on of hands and resurre resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. We should be moving on as God permits. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he's, he talks about this. He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And but when I became a man, I gave up those childish things. I put those away. And I moved on to the things of maturity. And last week we talked about the growth of, from being a disciple of Christ and supplementing that to being both a disciple of Christ and to one who is making disciples of Christ, right? We talked about that. We're all called to be disciples of Christ, but we're also called towards making disciples of Christ, to take that step of maturity so now that we're teaching others and we're, we're focusing on winning others to Christ and, and sharing that same amazing experience of rebirth, of being born again, with those that we know and those that are in those spheres of influence around us. Just like Jesus' disciples. I mean, it took three years with Jesus Christ, going to seminary with the Lord, and still they were struggling. As he was crucified and buried, they scattered, and even after he rose from the dead, they're still not quite getting it. And it wasn't until the day of Pentecost when they they went out on the streets after the Holy Spirit was given to them that, 
everything changed. And they transformed from being strictly disciples to those who were making disciples, powerfully. So we don't need to be laying that same elementary foundation over and over and over again. We don't need to keep going back to that same milk. We need to be, like Paul says, when he talked about our walk, we need to be, as we walk out our walk with the Lord, straining toward the finish line. We're on this race. He talked about all he encountered, all Paul that encountered during his journey. He talked about shipwrecks and imprisonments and beatings with lashes and beatings with rods and stonings, being cold and being hungry. His journey and the journey that the Lord asks us to make is not a walk through the park. Just doing a few laps around the house or a lap to church and back more than that. That's that call to maturity that we're talking about here. That may be the journey of the American church, but that's not the journey that God laid out in the New Testament. He said, take up your cross daily and deny yourself. Give up your life and follow me. It wasn't squeeze me in when you can and living a crowded, frantic life instead of an abundant life. It wasn't that. He said, move on from those pureed green beans. Move toward the ribeye and the crown roast and the grilled salmon, maybe with a little dill sauce and maybe some sweet potatoes. Amen? All right. I'm hungry now. <laughs> we talk about getting out of our comfort zones last week. I think we talk about that almost every week. Living that crucified life of using the gifts that he has blessed us with to develop Relationships with others, right? Develop those relationships that we can use to influence them. And tell them about how God is taking us from being lost in sin to a life of abundant blessing. Now, in this life, an unfathomable blessing in the life to come. We need to keep moving forward in this journey. Every day, just taking another step, as Jeremy talked about, is you know, he talked, shared about being called to go deeper and deeper into those waters. And sometimes we feel like, whoa, Lord, it's up to my neck. I don't know what to do. I, I can't even handle what I've got now. And he just asks us to walk in faith and keep going because he's going to provide. He's going to give us that solid ground to walk on. And you keep moving forward in that journey, growing closer to him every day. So our thoughts are his thoughts, and so that our desires are his desires. So we don't wander in search of what his will for our life is. That shouldn't be something that we're just out flailing around trying to figure out, what does God want me to do? We should be living it every day. As we, as we are knit to him in intimate prayer, in time in the word, and giving our lives to ministering and encouraging each other in fellowship. So as we spend our lives, each minute of every day, if we spend that time in intimate prayer, and if we seek his face through the reading of the word, and through the fellowship of others, we get to sense what his will for our lives is daily. And so you start to live in that relationship, and as we pray, we come into alignment with his will. And so every day as you walk out, you feel confident that I'm in the will of God today. And when he starts to speak to you, you've, you've created margin in your life such that you can hear him. You've got that peace. And as you read his word and you spend that time in prayer, it's this intimate relationship. moving on from the elementary doctrines toward that maturity. Moving forward and not being stagnant. Not staying in that same place and just doing laps. We're moving forward on that race and striving toward the finish line. We're going to be moving forward and 
God forbid, not going backwards. In verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 6, it says, For it's impossible, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding him to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it, and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. It's a tough passage. It's one of those passages where many commentators scramble for the exits. If you go look at some of the, the writings of, of some of the scholars here, they're, they either come into this passage with a doctrine already established in their mind and work this passage into their doctrine, or they ignore it entirely. But we're going to work through this. So let's take a look at this passage and see what it's all about. It starts off with four very powerful words. It says, for it is impossible. What's impossible? And, and, and who, for whom is it impossible? Let's take that second question for, first. Whom, it's impossible for whom? Well, as it listed here in, the, in those verses, it says, those that have once been enlightened, and that word once in the Greek means once and for all. For those who have, for once and for all, have been enlightened. For those who have tasted or experienced the heavenly gift. Those who have shared who are partaking of and partnering with the Holy Spirit. Those who have tasted and experienced the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. The powers of the age to come, that dunamis that we talk about. The power of the coming kingdom of God. So who does that describe in your mind? If you just read those words, who does that describe? It doesn't, to my mind, describe someone who's dabbled in following the Word or following the Lord. Well, it sounds like a believer. A believer has been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit, and they've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the ages to come. And so that's for whom it's impossible. We answered that question. It's impossible for the believer. So now let's answer the question, so what's impossible? What is it that we're talking about here? If all of that, all that we just described, can be said of someone, and they have fallen away, it says. In the Greek it says, to, it really means to fall away after being close beside. After you've been close beside something, you've, you've fallen away from it. You've defected from it or abandoned it. If a believer abandons the faith, becomes apostate, and completely and finally rejects Jesus as Savior, it says it's impossible to restore them to repentance. That Greek word there is metanoia. It's impossible for that change of mind to be restored. Why? Why would that be true? As it says, it goes on and says, because since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him to contempt. Those are serious words. So that's what the text says there. So when we take that text, we need to also compare it to the rest of Scripture. We kind of hold it up and compare it to what the rest of the Word of God says. And as I was reading through this, I looked at what the Pastor Chuck Smith had written. And, and his first question as he had struggled with his passage, he says, well, what about Peter? Let's look back at what, what happened with Peter after Jesus had been taken and arrested and, and led captive. What happened with Peter there? And, 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 and Jesus had predicted exactly what would happen with Peter. He said, you're going to you're going to deny me three times before the, the cock crowed, didn't he? And that's exactly what happened. Peter denied knowing Christ. I don't even know him. You don't know what you're talking about. Three times. The leader of this group. And yet when Jesus came back from the dead and was restored to the disciples, 
He completely restored Peter into fellowship, didn't he? In fact, Peter was not only restored, but he took on again a leadership position among the disciples, upon this rock. Jesus liked to call Peter rock. I'm not sure exactly why, but there may be a double meaning there for Peter. But Jesus said, upon this rock, he's going to build his church. And so it appears clearly that if I falter, or if I fall into sin, or fail under pressure to live up to God's expectations, that I'm not out forever, doesn't it? That's not true. Obviously, we sin, and we fail, and we falter. And so this passage isn't talking about that, that I'm not, I'm not out if that happens. God is gracious, and God is merciful and long-suffering. And if, if that does happen, if we do falter and we do fall into sin, there will likely be consequences. But he will be there to lovingly receive me as I come back to him. And he will restore me into fellowship. So I believe here what, what is being discussed is if you completely walk away from your relationship with the Lord, your heart is hardened big time. Jesus is calling you back, and you will not come back. Your heart is hard and you say, no way. I don't want any part of that. I don't want anything to do with you. Then this passage should give you concern. But if you have a yearning for God and are trying to find that place of rest in Him, and we all know people like that, people who have fallen away but are coming back, just like Peter, and He's right there and ready to help you get back on course as we fall short of the glory of God, as we all fall short. God is right there. Jesus is right there, ready for you when you call back to restore you into his relationship. And as we move on into verse 7, it, it kind of echoes this. It says, the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it produces a crop useful, produces a crop that is useful to those who, for whose sake it is cultivated. It received that blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and in its end, to be burned. So land that takes the rain and produces a useful crop is cultivated and blessed, isn't it? And land that takes that same rain, that same abundance, and produces what is worthless and is in danger of being cursed and burned. That rings a bell. That sounds familiar. Jesus taught in John chapter 15, a very similar theme. He said in chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what happens? He takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. That it may bear more fruit. And already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, Pay attention to this part now. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Very similar passage here, but we just read in Hebrews. But, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory, glory to my Father. So what's the bottom line with all this? What's this all mean? I think the key word in all of this is abide. Abide in Him and obedient to what He calls you to do. For we are His children if we're born again, right? We are His children. He is our Father. We all sin and falter. We all fall short. And he's there to pick us up and restore us and help us to learn from that. But we've got to continue to abide in him. 
And as long as we continue to abide in him, he is Lord over our lives, isn't he? And that takes all of this other stuff off the table. It's not even a part of the discussion. We don't need to be concerned with it if we're abiding. If I'm abiding, then I am eternally secure. End of discussion. We don't need to worry about all that other stuff that people debate about. If I am in, abiding in Him, I am eternally secure. No debate. No question. Verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the author moves on and reassures them. He says, in your case, we feel sure of better things. God sees what you're doing. And the love that you have for his name in serving. And our desire is that each of you show the same earnestness, the same zeal, the same priority in your life. Don't be sluggish or lazy in this area. This should be what you're all about. And if it's not, then look for those for which serving the Lord does consume them and imitate them. Hang out with them. Spend time with them. That stuff rubs off on you. It's contagious. And he says, those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience. I need some of that. Don't you? Faith and patience. In the Greek, the word for patience is long-tempered. I've heard of short-tempered. This Greek word here is long-tempered. Think about what God could accomplish through us if we had both faith and patience. Psalm 37, 1a. First part of Psalm 37, 1 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. I don't know about you, but I love to run ahead. I love to help God get things done quickly. And then I love to run back quickly because I've just made a huge mess. What I've come to realize is that oftentimes the best thing we can do, the best thing we can do is to wait. Peacefully wait on him and do the ministry that's around us as he is doing his work in us and in whatever circumstances he's preparing for. I remember seven or eight years ago, I felt a tremendous burden in my life to become a pastor. But it wasn't time yet for me. God had to do some work in me, and he had to do some work in the circumstances around me. And I, I had no clue what those were to be. And I was very impatient. I was trying to take things into my own hands. Because God obviously needed my help to do it. And it was very frustrating for me. Because that's the kind of person I am. I want to make it happen. But God wanted to do a work in me and show me patience along with a lot of other things. And then as time went by and, he, and that work was accomplished, and things came together, it all happened. And it all happened in just the right way, as he willed it. And so I learned through that to, to have faith in him that he's going to work it out. If he's put a calling on your heart and, and you know that someday you're supposed to be doing whatever it is God puts you on your heart, and yet it isn't quite time yet. Have that faith and patience to let the, wor let the Lord work it out. Because it's going to end up much better than if you try to work it out for yourself. Peacefully wait on him and do the ministry that's around you. So by waiting, it doesn't mean don't do anything. Do the ministry where you're planted. Do the ministry that, where you are. Oftentimes we strive to determine the Lord's will on something and we aren't just getting that direction. And when that happens, my pastor used to say, old orders are good orders. If 
you are where you are and you kind of still feel like you're in that desert place, God hasn't given you that, that direction to move into a new place, then old orders are good orders. And be at peace for where you are. Keep doing what you, you're doing until he directs you otherwise. As we talked about earlier, that the best way to determine what the, Lord, the Lord's will is is not to look for some sign or some miraculous voice from heaven or throwing out fleece and, and casting lots. It's to be in that place daily of prayer and in the Word and, and just constantly being in that relationship with Him. And He will speak to you. That's still a small voice. If you create that margin for Him, such that your thoughts are His thoughts and your actions are His actions. It doesn't require a brick to fall on your head with a note tied to it that says, be still and quiet. I'm trying to talk to you and tell you what to do. That's how we should be in our relationship with God. And it's tough in this frantic world we live in, isn't it? Work and kids and all the stuff that tends to consume our lives in this culture. And it's difficult sometimes to hear that voice. That's stuff that I know I work on. I try to find that time and carve out that time with him so that I can hear his voice. Try to be filled with faith and patience as we wait for him to do his work and then follow him as he says, okay, now it's time to go. Can't say, oh, not yet. That's when we need to be obedient and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to have faith and I'm going to walk into those deep waters. Now it's time to go. Verse 13 continues. He says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his promise, I'm sorry, of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. As I read through this, he, he talks about Abraham having patiently waited. We go back to Genesis chapter 22. We read more about this whole thing about Abraham and God swearing to Abraham. As he swore by himself. Verse 15, we pick it up, and it says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. By myself I have sworn. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, Isaac. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God had no one greater by whom to swear in his promise to Abraham, did he? He had no one greater to swear so he swore, by himself. he swore by himself and said, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And so Abraham, having patiently waited, for the most part, except for that little Hagar thing, having patiently waited, see what happens when you don't patiently wait? You get yourself in trouble. He obtained the promise. Abraham obtained that promise. And Pete says, people swear by something greater themselves as the final word in disputes. If you go to give testimony in court, what do you do? You hold up your right hand and you swear. 
You take an oath. You go to serve on a jury. You take an oath. So when God wanted to communicate more convincingly, he didn't just give him the promise. He wanted to communicate even more convincingly. He swore by himself. He made an oath. And so we have two unchangeable things here. We have the promise, and then we have the oath that God swore to the promise. We who have fled for refuge, speaking to the Hebrew Christians in this case, who are under persecution, they might have strong encouragement. And it says strong encouragement to what? We have strong encouragement to hold fast. To hold fast to the hope that is set before us. That is cool to me. We have strong encouragement to hold fast in those times when it is difficult. And we have every reason to let go and to leave. As Jeremy talked about, it's, it's so easy to kind of pick up and I'm, I'm just chucking it all. It's hard. God calls us into that place where it's difficult to remain and stay and wait and patiently endure. But we have this as our strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And this hope includes us, doesn't it? This, this promise to Abraham includes us as well, even though we're not Jews. We go to Galatians chapter 3. If you turn there, chapter 3, verse 27. Paul writes to them about this. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We've put on Christ. And there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. We've been grafted in now through faith in Christ as children of faith, heirs of the promise and the oath, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. I don't know about you, but the way my life is, a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul sounds really good to me, doesn't it? sure and steadfast anchor to my soul. What else do we have that is sure and steadfast? Think about it. What else do we have where we put our confidence in? And we have that hope, it goes on to say, that enters the inner place behind the curtain of the Holy, Holies in the, the Holy of Holies in the temple, where blood is sprinkled for the forgiveness of, forgiveness of sins inside. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into that inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, becoming a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The author again brings in the point, which will continue in the next chapter, chapter 7 of Hebrews, about Melchizedek and how he was a priest of Salem and how he blessed Abraham. Actually, it was Abram at that time, after he had victory over the, the king of Elam. And how Jesus is a high priest forever according to that same order. And figuratively, he went in advance on our behalf into the Holy of Holies. He went behind the veil, as the high priest would do once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he sacrificed himself, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And when Jesus was crucified and we gave up his spirit, what happened to that veil? That veil that they say the tradition holds was six inches thick, was torn from top to bottom, was rent apart, and gave access to that place. We now have access. We can now come boldly to the throne of grace, to that mercy seat that had been blocked, up, blocked off for all but the high priest to enter once a year. Torn in two from top to bottom. That's the firm base upon which what, that sure and steadfast anchor is fixed. That is what that whole thing is based upon. That sure and steadfast anchor is fixed upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
that we now have access to boldly enter that throne of grace. Think about what you put your hope in way down deep. Think about what you put your hope in as you encounter an issue. You encounter desperation. As we come up against difficult times, desperate times, think about what it is you look to as an anchor. And if it's not Jesus Christ, it's going to fail you or disappoint you someday. Jesus Christ is the sure and steadfast anchor. He's the only one that will never disappoint. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. He didn't come to the Corinthians philosophizing. He didn't come to the Corinthians just showing how wise he was, how smart he was, how great he was as an elocutioner, as a great speaker. He didn't do that. For I decided to know nothing among you except what? I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is our anchor. Everything else we do is extra, is, is not central to that. If it's not central to that, it's not our sure and steadfast anchor. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I love that. Paul was a man of letters. He was a man who had been brought up in the best of all possible Hebrew world, worlds and, and learning everything you could possibly learn under Gamaliel. And if there was anyone who could come with lofty wisdom, to the Corinthians and talk about traditions and other things that they could put their hope in, it would have been Paul. But that's not what he came with. He put all that stuff aside, just like we should put everything else aside that we might put our hope in. Everything else aside that we might put our trust in, except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Right? That's central. That's our focus. He alone is our anchor. He alone is our steadfast hope. He alone allows us to grow and mature in Him and to move on from those elementary things we talked about. Not to stagnate, or worse, to go back. But being still and waiting patiently in the Word and in prayer, creating margin in our life so we can hear His voice. Growing as a disciple so we can make disciples not with lofty speech or wisdom, but knowing nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's pray. God, it's humbling to open up Your Word and, and read these words that You spoke through Your ministers 2,000 years ago. And Lord, we pray this morning as, as we read through them anew, as, we, as they take root in our hearts, we pray, Lord, that you would change us. We pray, Lord, as we hear about these ministries in places like Roatan and Honduras, and as we go to different places, like we've been to Nicaragua, we've been to Haiti, we've been to Peru, and as we go out into the streets just outside our doors here, and we see people in need, we see people not just in need physically, but in need spiritually. We want nothing else but to pre preach Christ and Him crucified, and raised from the dead. So Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would shake us out of the comfort of our lives, that you would shake us out of that place of being stagnant where it's easy to get into 
that you would shake us if we've slidden backwards. That you would burn like that fire and help it burn anew in our hearts. That we'd open up the lenses so that light would shine brightly. It would be a beacon, like a lighthouse to all those around us, both individually and as a fellowship here. As we go out those doors today, that sure and steadfast anchor would be nothing of the world, nothing of material things or physical things or of other people, but that sure and steadfast anchor would be you alone. And as that anchor holds, even though we face the stormy, difficult times of life, we pray that as people see us, that that anchor is keeping us fixed, keeping us steady, keeping us sure that people see that hope and ask us for the reason for that hope, that you would give us those words our hope is in Christ alone. And we'd be able to share with others the amazing, transformational things that you have done in our lives. So Lord, as we go out today, bless each and every one of us. Give us the joy. Give us the patience. Give us that peace that we need as we endure this life, as we run this race and take on that ministry that you have given us that would be obedient to that calling. So when you do say, who will go for me? We would respond, here am I, send me. We pray these things in Jesus' name.